of this song. <laughs> I guess I don't get <laughs> mean on anything. It says, may God, uh, he opens wide the heavenly door and lives now inside us forever. That's what we're talking about tonight. The incarnation. Have you heard that word? The incarnation. It has taken our church fathers centuries to understand a little bit of this word, the incarnation. I-N-C-A-R-N-A-T-I-O-N. -N -N. It means to be brought into flesh. Basically, that's what the word itself means. But it's really about Jesus Christ and us, not just Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is about us. In the Book of Wisdom, it tells us, when peaceful stillness compassed everything, and the night in its swift course was half spent, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded a fierce warrior into the doomed land. And as he alighted, he filled every place he still reached to heaven while he stood on earth. That's our Jesus Christ. He came to earth. Well, I shouldn't say he came to earth. We just read about his nativity. He was born of the Virgin Mary. And when a baby is born, they take their flesh and blood from the mother, right? They take their flesh and blood from the mother. So Jesus, Jesus himself, though he is God, he is fully human being. Sometimes in, in the centuries after Jesus' birth, <clears throat> after his walking on earth with his fellow human beings, after his horrible crucifixion, the church was very, they, they didn't know exactly what to think about Jesus. Jesus the Christ. That means Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And we say, how can that be? And it's taken the church and many people to try to explain that. And I think, how am I going to explain it in 40 minutes, in 40 days, in 40 years, in 400? because it is the mystery of God with us. It's that very mystery of God with us. He came not for himself. He came for us. Christ is sent by the Father into the world to liberate the human race from its state of decrepitude. We can say, well, maybe it's, he's not finished yet. Our world is not exactly peaches and cream and going real well about anything and everything. There's uh, this 
Erasmus. He, he is a Jew. He was a Jew, I should say. And he joined the church. And then he became a monk. And he's written three volumes like this, all on the Gospel of Matthew. All of this is just about the Gospel of Matthew. And I like to read what he talks about in the beginning. <clears throat> he says something about this Jesus, what God had prepared from Adam to Christ and from Christ to us. He says, so Christ is sent by the Father to liberate us but at the same time, what tremendous dignity God acknowledges humankind to possess when he reveals to it a mystery that has been contained within the very fiber of our flesh, generation after generation after generation. You know, in Genesis it said, God made us in his image and likeness. That is the first state of humankind in the very image and likeness of God. But unfortunately, our first parents thought there was another way. And they allowed evil to come through them into the world and consequently to us. And yet we still have that blessing of generation after generation being made in the image and likeness of God. And Jesus, when he comes, he comes as God into our human flesh, and not just like a teacup and a, and a plate. He comes like Mary giving birth to that child. He comes with all the makings of a human being, flesh and blood, thought, intelligence, and this is wedded to the divinity of God. When I think of this, it just blows my mind. I, I can't think of it because it's too much. To know that in this person of Jesus Christ, here walks God on earth. And we say, okay, how do we what do we do if we look at Jesus and we try to imitate him, try to do what he did? He was a human being like us. He had a mother. Joseph gave him his name. He went around. He maybe had a little family friction because he said, who's my mother and brother? He left home, settled down in Capernaum. He um, got angry, threw the, those money changers out of the temple. Just in, in the reading today for um, Mass, he said, he felt compassion for those people. They were hungry, and he wanted to feed them. Have you ever had an experience where you wanted to do something and you didn't know how to do it? You, you didn't feel you had the capacity or the things or whatever you needed to do it? Jesus felt that way. He, he, um, He came 
to lead us, not only lead us, but he came first to save us from ourselves. And very possibly, when we follow Jesus, we come to know ourselves in our deepest being. Because we are more than we are. If you can imagine that, that you're more than you are. Because we bear, we incarnate God within us. St. Augustine tells us, God became man so man can become God. That's you and I. You and I. We are called to be God, God-like. He made us in his image. And so he, Jesus came to show us that way. So if we can look at Jesus, which means I used to think, well, how am I going to do this? And I said, well, I guess the best way is if I start reading the Bible. You know? read, read those Gospels. If you're going to do what Jesus did, you've got to know what he did, right? You can't just imagine it. Well, the Holy Spirit does come and help us. That's a very consoling thought. That we do have help from the Holy Spirit. So, when we are trying to understand this incarnation, there were many people had a hard time with this. There are many. In the first two or three centuries of the church, there, were, there must have been six, seven, or eight, or nine heresies because they couldn't get their hands, they couldn't get their minds around this truth. This is the central truth of our faith. The incarnation is the central truth of our faith. And I, it, it calls on a very open faith in God, in the Spirit, in Jesus Christ. You know, we have ancestors in the faith. Abraham. You know Abraham? Have you heard of Abraham? When he goes up this mountain with his young son, the son that is supposed to carry on the covenant, and he's going to offer him up to God. That's what he thinks God is telling him to do. So he puts him on the altar, binds him, and he puts the wood around him ready to sacrifice him. He has the knife up there, and God holds his hand and he says, your faith has made you righteous. Your faith. If you read the book of the Hebrews, chapter 11, it tells what faith is. And then it gives you all the different people who uh, exhibited faith in the Old Testament. There was Abraham. There was Noah. I don't know if you ever uh, saw this movie. What's it called? Evans Mighty. Evan Almighty. Evan Almighty. <laughs> he was supposed to build this ark. Well, way back then, Noah was supposed to build this ark. And you say, that's really crazy. But in faith, they acted, and in faith, they were uh, redeemed. They were saved. They were brought through their trial. So St. Paul tells us that this um, incarnation, Jesus, Christ, Jesus the Christ, Jesus fully human, 
Christ is God. He said, this is a stumbling block for the Jews and it's an absurdity for the Gentiles. And I imagine we fall someplace in there when we try to understand our life, our life in God, our faith. What does it mean? Just two days ago I had somebody ask me, what is faith? I didn't even know if I believe. It's not an easy road, faith, because it's faith. It's really trust in this truth that God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ. It's a living faith. It's an obedient faith. Not because somebody told us to do it, but because we have come to know in our hearts that this is what God wants for us. I'm jumping all around, but anyway, we, I don't know how I can express the awesomeness, and the beauty, the wonder, the reality of God becoming man. Maybe thinking of who God is. God created the world. You look up at the heavens, you see the stars. You look around your farmland and you see all kinds of things. You see rivers. You have floods, right? I hope you all got over the flood. I heard Osmond wasn't very blessed at that time. But he, he's created, you know, when you travel around the world, you see immense creation. You, you see mountains, you see rivers, you see oceans, you see Everything God created. This God who humbled himself, who came to us because he loves us so much that he was willing, as St. Paul says, to become a slave for us. He left his divinity the awareness of his divinity behind in order to become a human person like us. A human person who has feelings. A human person who knows difficulties. A human person who was criticized. A human person who was ostracized. A human person was who they wanted to crown king. He was a human person who experienced all of what we experience. But he experienced even more than what we experience. He even allowed himself to go to death on a cross. This incarnational God. He allowed himself to go to the cross. And I understand that was a very, very painful death. And it was meant for the, the uh, worst criminals. And here Jesus, innocent, was crucified for us. But what 
redeems everything. He rose from the dead and he is still with us. He sent his Holy Spirit to us, to you, to me, to everyone here. He wants us to enjoy our humanity because we are created as children of God. We are created in the image of God. So when we look at Jesus, we know what it's like. We can know what it's like to be children of God. And we look at Jesus so that we can also be an incarnation of God on earth and we pass that on to the next generation. This has been happening since Christ. The followers of Jesus passed it on. And they passed it on. And they passed it on. And they passed it on. And I, as I was looking, uh, what time is it? I have a little video too that might explain it better. But as I was looking uh, for on the YouTube about the incarnation, I was really struck at how many different Christian denominations talk about the incarnation. This is a truth that crosses all Christian borders because it is God who came to earth. It is God who incarnated himself in our flesh, in who we are. And he continues to do so. He continues to come to you and say, I love you. I want to be with you. I want to share your life. I want to give my life to you. And so, this incarnation is not something that happened when, only when Jesus walked the earth. He continues to walk the earth in us, in us faithful Christians, as we pass it on to the next generation. I don't know if you've heard of the, the group Seek, or the, what are they? Um, every year they, for college students, they have a big conference called the SEEK Conference. And at that conference, the, the, all the kids that are there, they usually invite them, you know, if you would just invite one person or two people, by the next time we meet, there will be that many more thousands. And if you think of the apostles, there were just 12 of them. 12 that Jesus appointed. And they passed on this truth, this faith in Jesus Christ. And they passed it on, and they passed it on. There are Christians, Catholicism, all over the world. And we believe in this same God who came to incarnate us. So that God came, became man so we can become God. That makes us feel very humble. How can we? How can we? How can we? But I invite you. During this Advent, pick up the scriptures and see what Jesus did. See who Jesus was. See who Jesus is. Look and see who this God is that wants to incarnate himself in you. I was talking to a bunch of little kids in my hometown, and I said, you know, Whenever we do a good act, we are being like Jesus. 
because St. Mark says he went around doing good. He went around doing good. And every good act that I do, it is like God is doing it with me, in me. Because, because as, as uh, young man said, good Lord, good, uh, good master, can you tell me what the best, the highest commandment is, or which is the best of all the commandments? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good when only my heavenly Father is good? And so I extrapolate from that, that whenever I do a good deed, whenever I do something good, I am living out my God-like character. When I was in China and I couldn't speak the language, I said, how am I going to tell these people about God? Anyway, you couldn't get on a pulpit like this and talk to them anyway. So I said, I'll just smile. And I did. Invariably, I got a smile back. Simple thing. Doesn't have to be big thing. If somebody's down and you say, can I do something for you? It doesn't take much. It's just being attentive being attentive to one another, being respectful of one another, being kind, compassionate. Jesus was all of those things. So now I would just like to show you a little um, YouTube. This is uh, Father Connor. He probably says it better than I do, so I'll let you take a look at him what he has to say about the Incarnation. I don't know if you have the Catholic Catechism. It has something in there about it. I have some books back there that if you would like to read more on the Incarnation, there's some books there. It's really about Jesus' life. This is where I take some of my ideas. Fully human, fully divine. So these are uh, helpful books to help you understand a little bit more what it means, the incarnation. Thank you. Let's watch. One main question is if the doctrine were distant and irrelevant. I want to suggest that um, the doctrine of the church actually holds a very beautiful and essential truth for us. Let me give an example. The doctrine of the incarnation, and we frightened by the big word uh, in its most simple form, it simply means God came to us in Jesus and dwells among us. The word became flesh and dwells among us. Well, I believe that this doctrine, this fact, this reality, is something that most Christians have a lot of difficulty with. They believe that 2,000 years ago, God in Jesus became human, but struggle with the fact that God in Jesus lives among us today, dwells among us in the ordinary, difficult, challenging reality of every day. And this is what the doctrine of the Incarnation speaks to. And this is the fact that we most need in our lives. It's so easy to have a sense that God is distant, that God is distant physically, certainly, but uh, people often struggle to live with uh, a sense they have that God is not really where they are, that if they got their lives more in order, or if they prayed more, or if they, if they were a, a better person, then they would be able to experience the uh, reality of God with them more. But of course, this is a denial of the doctrine of the Incarnation. An example to explain this. I was a few years ago with a friend in Italy, and we had rented a car, we were driving, and uh, thanks be to God, we had uh, GPS, which made it possible to 
uh, to drive without getting too lost in, in Italy. But we were driving from Rome to Assisi. We had a very clear uh, departure point, uh, Termini in Rome, where uh, we picked up the car. And Assisi was the uh, arrival point. As we were driving along the road, helped by the, the, the GPS, which was guiding us, we saw a village up on the hill in the distance, a, a beautiful medieval village. And of course, the thought was, well, wouldn't it be great to visit that? But we had our goal, our destination, and it seemed wrong to deviate from that. But we decided we'd take the risk, and we turned off the road, and the uh, GPS kept telling us rerouting, rerouting, making a U-turn, making a U-turn. <coughs> we ignored it, got to the village, spent a great couple of hours, and then came back to the car and reset the GPS. Now, the interesting thing was that I think I had in the back of my mind that the GPS would lead us back to where we went wrong, and then we would um, have to make the right turn instead of the wrong turn we made earlier to head to Assisi, our destination. But of course, that's not what happened. When we got into the car, the GPS began from that point to lead us to Assisi. This helped me a lot, and I know that others have found the example helpful. You see, wherever we are, God comes to us. And our beginning point, because of the doctrine of the Incarnation, is where we are now. Not where we think we should be, or where we think God might like us to be. What we ever, but, but wherever we find ourselves in this moment is the place where God is going to work with us today. Doesn't matter how we went wrong in the past. God is leading us from where we are. And the real challenge for us is to be where we are, to acknowledge that where we are, maybe imperfect, maybe burdened by the guilt of sin, wherever we are, is the place where God is waiting to meet us. This is the wonderful beauty of the fact, the reality, the doctrine of the Incarnation. So if I open it up to any questions you might have, to any clarifications or any thoughts that you would like to share, or if there's something that bothers you about what we're talking about this evening. As my brother would say, it's clear as mud. <laughs> I hope it's clearer than that. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, a, it's a great mystery, but it's a beautiful one. And it can bring us out of ourselves. It can actually, I mean, we can find ourselves in Christ in Jesus. He tells us who we are. The wonderful, wonderful gift that we are created by God in his image. So I leave you with that thought. Thank you.